Welcome to Freedom Fanatics. Each week we discuss the latest fan content with authors and creators right here. My guests today are Herman and Alex. Thank you guys for being on the show today. Um, so first up, we'll be watching our latest explainer video that provides us with an, ex with an alternative to BEE. Let's go. We all know that BEE really stands for blatant elite enrichment. Isn't it time to dump policies that help the rich and powerful with their greed, but fail to give ordinary people what they need? It's time for non-racial economic empowerment for the disadvantaged. Developed by the South African Institute of Race Relations, led by Dr. Enthea Jeffrey, NEED is a practical and fair alternative to BEE. Where BEE keeps apartheid era racism alive in jobs market and motivates big businesses to bribe political elites with fake economic killing jobs. NEED helps vulnerable people, no matter the color of their skin, helps distant businesses give struggling, hardworking people a fair chance to get a real job and escape poverty. NEED empowers South Africans by taking resources out of the hands of the government's cronies and caters and putting it in the hands of ordinary people who are struggling to make ends meet. Instead of politicians being in charge of your education, healthcare, housing, NEED gives resources and control to people trying to fight their way out of poverty. School vouchers to send kids to good schools chosen by parents. Healthcare vouchers to get proper treatment from the clinic or hospital people choose. Housing vouchers, empowering struggling people with the resources to build or to buy their own homes. Let's give crippling poverty a knockout blow. Let's dump BEE and give people the help they need. Your freedom is worth fighting for. Join FAN today to build a new tomorrow. So we just watched our latest explainer video. And now to dive a bit deeper into it, um, I first need to say that it is a relief to know that there are practical and effective alternatives to failing government policy. But Alex, can you just give us some context to the video and maybe just take us through the areas which need focuses on? Yeah, sure. So in our previous explainer video, we ran through the, the failings of BEE as a blatant elite enrichment tool. Um, that's used by the government uh, to enrich themselves rather than the people that they serve. Um, and so instead of just bashing government, uh, we've um, brought forward a solution in the form of NED or need policy. And I think the important thing about the need policy is its, its emphasis on the true fundamentals of a family household in education, um, healthcare, and housing. Um, and so the, the proposal, as, as we see there, is, is done through, um, through a voucher system, um, giving control back to parents uh, to take control of their lives, um, rather than dishing out money and having schemes where people can enter through the back door. Um, and all the, the, the sort of the results of that uh, only going to enhance patronage. Um, and I know Her Herman, Herman's quite, quite clued up on exactly how how these vouchers would would in theory work if the government was actually to take on board something that that was truly beneficial to the people. Yeah, now I must say school vouchers especially is one of my favorite policies ever because I, I really think it is such such a healthy way of solving a problem because too often, you know, people can be divided in the state should do everything or the state should do nothing. And, uh, you know, where do you draw the line? But I think school vouchers, as an example, is really a good take on how to strike that balance. Because, yes, the taxpayer is willing to fund good, proper things that the government should uh, use to make people's lives better. Just by the way, here's a puppy here. So if he gets rambunctious, I will hand over control to, of the conversation to you guys. But the good thing is that about a quarter, a quarter of the national budget goes to education. And do we have the results to show for it? I don't think so. But I think parents know when their kids can get a good education and what that can mean for their kids. Where fund, school funding currently goes through so many levels. Uh, you know, to the from, from the treasury down to the department, down to the provinces, to the uh, regions, to the schools. 
the school voucher thing takes that quarter of our education and it goes directly to the parents with a child's name on it so it can't go to something else. It cuts out so many destructive things while at the same time giving poorest people the chance to go to the best schools. Yeah, something government should really understand at this point is that we don't actually want the race life policies that target specific race groups or whatever. Like we just want things which which all South Africans want is just like improved education, healthcare and housing, which are all the issues that need actually does tackle. So Armin, I'd actually also want you to actually just explain to us a bit about why the government is so reluctant to actually implement effective policies like this. I think it's one of two reasons. Either our puppies bite so. Uh, number one is either it's an ideological thing um, where they want to, where they genuinely believe that the government, the state can make better decisions for kids than the parents or guardians of the kids, which I think is bizarre and absurd. And I've never actually met an ordinary person who believes that. Or they want control of the money. I think it's a bit of both. Now, they can have one control of the money for a few reasons some good, some bad, some corrupt. But the point is what ultimately comes down to the hesitance on government to implement these sorts of policies is I think they think they know better than ordinary people. And I think that's just nonsense. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So yeah, thank you guys for your insight on our latest explain the video. And guys, remember that all our explain the videos can be found on our social media platforms on IGTV, on Facebook and YouTube, and they are released every Monday. So please be remember that like, every Monday you check out our social media platforms for that. And share it. And share and it. Share it. Share the link everywhere on Facebook to all of your friends and all of your family members. So now just to move on to our written content of the week, and we're actually going to be discussing an article that was written by Herman himself. Um, and it is titled Youth Unemployment. So us you have a hot Mr. President. Um, so the current youth unemployment de death spiral should frighten all South Africans, especially the government, which is something Herman politely, to say the least, um, highlights. Um, so youth unemployment in South Africa at its latest measurement stands at a frightening 75%, which means that three out of every young South Africans do not have a job. Herman, how did we reach this point, please? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the fact that three out of every four young South Africans uh, don't have a job, I mean, that's just disastrous. Um, and, and perhaps I, I should say why it's disastrous, because the best way to actually start earning good money is through experience and climbing the jobs ladder. No one starts at the top. Um, it's, it's just too risky for businesses to hire um, young people at the bottom with limited skills, with limited track record, and then pay them a high rate salary. So the it shouldn't be, you know, uh, uh, an odd thing to start with entry level jobs and entry level payment, because that's where you can start developing the skills. We've reached this point because that option has been made more and more and more difficult through several forms of government intervention, something like the minimum wage makes it difficult because what the minimum wage essentially is, um, and it's, it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's got good intentions behind it. Um, but what it's essentially saying is, Sholin, if I want to work for you um, and we agree that you will pay me 50 rand an hour, but the minimum wage is 52 rand an hour and you really can't afford it, you can't hire me. You and I can't freely agree that I will work for the for the salary I'm willing to work and you're willing to pay. Now, the problem is, if you're going to make it more expensive to hire people, fewer people are going to get hired, especially fewer young people, because the minimum wage sets the, sets the entry level wage at a specific level. And as we just discussed, entry level jobs are simple jobs and entry level workers don't have experience and skills. So instead of having a system where you can get your foot on the employment ladder easily and start climbing through showing your skills, your innovation, the minimum wage just cuts out the bottom three little you know, steps of the employment ladder. So when a business needs to hire someone and they can either pick someone who's old and got the skills or young and don't have the skills but might have the potential, they're going to cost the business the same. So why take the risk of taking the inexperienced 
uh, uh, person when you can packaged into an older more experienced worker have that so we've reached this point by government through things like the minimum wage making it more and more difficult for young people to get a job and get on that jobs ladder and start developing those skills not to mention education but I think that's a that's a discussion for a whole different day. I don't go into it in my article because if I have to start writing, I will still be writing next month if we're going to look at the failures of education and youth unemployment. Yeah, I think also like a, a big fear for especially graduates um, and current students like myself, and I know Alex is, was recently a student, is that the fear is actually, even though you have a good education or you've gone to university, it does not guarantee the fact that you will have a job afterwards. And I don't think that's a really great incentive to have to, to give to people when they are pursuing further education or tertiary education, because there's no guarantee that any job could be provided for them. And I think at the and, uh, so, so sorry, sorry. I also want to make something uh, make a point there that it's not just about you know uh, education i don't know if you guys remember the sandwich king of joburg um, i can't remember his actual name but he is a young guy with a daughter and he thought what can i do well i can make sandwich sandwiches and sell them to business people in santon on their breaks they get a sandwich i make money the problem is he was pestered by municipal regulations government interference making it difficult for a guy to sell sandwiches we don't even have to go as complex as, you know, there's an architect that can't find a job or a, or a CA that can't find a job. You can't make sandwiches and sell them sometimes because of government interference. Yeah. And I, and I think at the core of, of South Africa's problem, and I think at the, a lot of South Africa's problems, there's one common denominator, and that is ineffective government policy. Um, and you could really state And that. a lack of freedom. Yes, mm. absolutely. And you also could really state in your article that Policy change is not a vaccine against socioeconomic problems, but the simple removal of policy such as the minimum wage would go a long way because it restricts businesses from hiring new em employees. Would be and, and if they were able to hire employees, it would be a great step in reducing the unemployment rates. Alex, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think what's what what i think specifically linking with be and uh, government intervention is that we need to get the government out of people's lives and that is what is so great about the need policy when, when because it relates to every single important aspect of somebody's life um mm -hmm. you know it, i mean we can talk as graduates from university the proportion of which you know 50% of, of grade ones, I think, who get to grade drop out by the time they get to grade 10, 4% are going to pass uh, matric maths with a, with a pass that's worth anything. Um, so then by the time you actually even get to university, 80% of maybe approximately 80% of your school going population has already fallen out of the system. And that's where, so the, 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 the problems are so deep. And if we can at least to start with getting you know the unions out of the way um giving parents control over their child's education that at least can be a first step into some sort of gainful employment and and also making people self-sufficient and also i think a very important thing to remember is dignity um you know you've got to, people need to feel like they are in charge of their life and that they have the best uh tools available that, um, you know, without the government uh, getting involved. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, Alex. Um, now, if we can just look at our quote of the week, which is by someone I admire, Tutukani Ndebele, and he is a senior analyst at the Center for Risk Analysis. And Tutukani brilliantly states that poor levels of performance in the school system condemn young generations of South Africans to unemployment, poverty, and dependency. And this was actually written by him five years ago, back in 2016, when he did a report for the Institute of Race Relations. And now, five years later, we can actually see the effects of the very thing that he has spoken about. And yeah, I just couldn't also agree with him anymore because I'm like, our education system is failing and it's government at the center 
of the problem. So yeah, that is it for this episode of Freedom Fanatics. Don't forget to catch us every Tuesday at 6 p.m. on YouTube, Facebook, and IGTV. And share this link, like, comment as much as you guys can. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you next week. Thank <laughs> you.